I'm Kim McClary, President and CEO of the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall. Thank you all so very much for joining us today. For those of you who are new to the Council, we are a 501c3 with the mission of informing our members and audiences about the most compelling international, national, and regional issues. We are a nonpartisan organization, and an important part of our programs is that we enable our audiences to ask questions to the speakers and panelists to foster a more engaged discussion. We will be taking your questions in about 25 minutes. You can submit your questions by entering them on the questions section on the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. Our vice president, Jessica Deganzik, will be managing your questions during the Q&A portion, and she'll try to get to as many of your questions as possible. It's now my pleasure to welcome you to today's program, The Human Factor, in conversation with its director, Dror Murray, and Robert Malley. It was such a special opportunity to see the film as it had planned to open in LA on January 22nd, which was no longer possible due to the theater closures. It is now slated to open in New York on January 22nd, and I think the hope is that the film will be opening in theaters whenever it's safe to do so. Uh, Dror Murray also directed the film The Gatekeepers, which we screened on the Sony lot a few years ago, and he was there for the Q&A, and Rob Malley did an event at Akasha with us in 2018, so it's so great to be working with them both again. It is now my pleasure to introduce Kevin Getz. Kevin is the founder and CEO of Screen Engine, and he's also a very active and appreciated member of our board of directors. Kevin, I'm so thrilled that uh, you're doing the introductions today. Oh, and thank you, Kim. A great conversation. Thank I'll you. turn it over to you sure. and Dror and Robert. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. It's a pleasure to do this. Um, this is a subject that is near and dear to my heart uh, for a variety of reasons. And I also uh, have the pleasure of working on, in the career that I am in, so many documentaries, uh, so many award-winning documentaries. And I must say that as an Academy member of the Motion Picture, of motion picture Arts and Sciences, uh, I, I it's on our list of movies to watch, and um, you have my vote. Uh, it's an extraordinary picture, uh, and I think most of us um, have so many questions to ask about it because it sparked so much. It's not uh, an easy subject, certainly, uh, but one that is very, very um, uh, um, uh, incites a lot of um, of, of discussion. Uh, before I ask you any questions, I'd like to introduce you both a little bit more formally. Uh, Dror uh, Moret began his career as a cinematographer in Israel. He became and known as one of the leading uh, directors of photography. His directorial debut was Sharon, which was a feature-length documentary uh, on the uh, former and controversial former uh, Prime Minister uh, Ariel Sharon. And, and his impact on the Gaza disengagement plan. And Dror achieved international recognition, as you know, Kim mentioned for his second documentary feature, The Gatekeepers, which was nominated for an Academy Award at the 85th um, Oscars. And The Gatekeepers really received tremendous international acclaim uh, and success around the globe and got tons of awards throughout uh, the, um, the, the, uh, uh, the world. And he then directed Rose, a six-part docudrama series, and is currently working on several other feature-length um, documentaries. In uh, 04, uh, Dror founded a production company called DMP, and it specializes in international co-productions. It's based in Tel Aviv. Uh, which is where uh, I think you are right now, Dror, right, correct? Yes. And focuses on regional and international geopolitical subjects that resonate with audiences, uh, again, around the globe. I also want to introduce Robert Malley, or Rob. 
1998, he was appointed special assistant to President Clinton for Arab-Israeli affairs, a key organizer of the 2000 uh, Camp David summit, as we saw in the, in the film. Following his service with the administration, Rob became senior policy advisor for the Center for Middle East Peace and Economic Development in Washington, DC. And in 2015, the Obama administration appointed Rob as its Middle East point man um, on the Middle East, which later actually uh, morphed into the task of becoming President Obama's new special ISIS advisor. Gentlemen, thank you. We welcome you. And please, on the uh, other side of this, um, uh, of this um, uh, broadcast, please help me and join me in welcoming both Dror and Robert. Thanks, gents. Dror, I'm gonna start with you, if I may. Uh, so I have to kind of separate my own personal love of the film and try to put my, um, my Walter Cronkite um, hat on uh, and uh, try to be a little bit more um, impartial, if I may. But I couldn't help walking away with these tremendous um, uh, sentiments of empathy, 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 earnestness, uh, truth, what these words mean to us, respect, and mutual acceptance. And yet, by the end of the film, um, it's bleak. It um, seems futile. I'm wondering what you, as the director as the creator of this um, documentary, The Human Factor. What did you want us to take away from uh, as an audience? I, I think for me, because, uh, you know, I, tort I tortured the people that were interviewed in the, in the movie. Uh, Rob was one of them, but each one of them was tortured for hours and hours in front of me. Rob is also participating in, in, in my next project. Uh, so we know each other very well. And, and what came out from all these tens of hours of, of interviews is the importance of the human factor. You know, in diplomacy, we think that uh, it's about issues mostly. It's not about the chemistry between the people that are inside the room. And what was so evident for me during the editing process is how much the relationship between the human beings that are supposed to take those decisions are important. If Arafat respects Rabin and Rabin respects Arafat, and maybe if Rabin would not been assassinated, we would have probably a different outcome than what we have today. Had Barak not been so arrogant and thinking he can uh, steer the wheel as he thought he should be, and be, pay more attention to the human factor in his relationship with Arafat, it might have been in another outcome. I don't know, but that's kind of, I felt, especially, you know, today, after what we've seen in Washington in the last two weeks, the human factor and diplomacy is crucial, is very, very important. And you cannot change that by sound bites or by uh, reality show uh, shows and creating diplomacy and really understanding the other side is something fundamental. And I think we lost that in the last decade, we lost that ability, or in the last five years, five years, we lost that ability to look at the other side and his needs from a human point of view and relate to that. And I think that that's what kind of motivated me or what I want people to take out of the movie mostly. So, Thank you. Uh, why do you suppose we've morphed into this um, this uh, em lack of empathy um, in terms of our leadership? And how do you think that? Uh, or, 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 why do you think this is a no more new phenomenon, or or is it a new phenomenon? I, I look. I'm not a sociologist. I'm a director of movies. I, but if you ask my personal point of view, I think that social media has a lot to do with that in our in our time and age. And the feeling of leaders that they can do everything by themselves or they understand better everything. And Rob is also the chairman of the uh, uh, of an amazing body which is uh, trying to reach 
reconciliation in, in places of, of conflicts all over the world. He does that brilliantly. And, and, and you know, you cannot, you cannot change the fact that you need professional people who understand the region, who understand the problems of the region deeply and not come, excuse me to all the Americans that are listening, come from an American point of view of we know all and we know better than anybody else and you have to fix the things the way we see it. No, you know, there is different the, the diversity and diversity lives every, in a lot of parts of the world and yes. you have to acknowledge that and you need people, professional people that understand that and that can help the leaders to reach basically uh, uh, an agreement or resolve a conflict. Sure. I mean, you know, the, 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 just one sentence, the movie was called in the beginning, The Negotiators, because I thought to concentrate on, on the part of the negotiators, but what came out was the human factor and the, the fact that the human factor was the most important part for me for understanding why we failed at the end, uh, which relates also not only to the relationship between the leaders, but also to the personality of the people involved, to the job of the mediators, to the job of the president himself, was crucial to understand why I would say the most intensive consumed diplomatic effort by the United States in the last three decades failed so miserably until today. So Gerard, why did you, what did you learn or what do you know now after making the movie that you didn't know or didn't expect before you started? I, and look, for me as an Israeli, um, I will be blunt a little bit now as an Israeli. <laughs> uh, you know, when I came, when Barack came to Cape David, he was basically from my camp. He came as my representative. When he was elected prime minister, he said, I'm continuing the work of Rabin. I'm the, I'm not Bibi Netanyahu, I'm the, and when he came back and said, there is no partner in the other side, I believed him. And the result of that was the second intifada, and, and the complete collapse of the peace process and as very beautifully uh, um, was said in the movie, we suffer from that, that consequences of the failure of Camp David until today. The lack of trust, the lack of the, the, the mistrust between the two parties is something that exists until today. And what I learned in the movie from the negotiators and although by the way, from my previous meeting, the gatekeepers, we agreed completely they coincided with what the negotiators, with what Rob, Dennis Ross, Gamal Khalal, Indik, all of the people that were in Camp David told me that Barack bears a lot of the responsibility for what happened in Camp David, for the collapse and the failure of Camp David. And this was something new for me because he came, as I said, from my camp, from the peace camp. And I, I thought that, you know, the blame was on, on, on Yasser Arafat and his refusal to accept the generous offer that Arafat gave him in Camp David. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Dror. Uh, Rob, uh, question for you. It would appear in the movie, at least, that there is no question that the most successful uh, administration was the Clinton administration in terms of advancing peace. Was that a result of the Clinton administration or was it a result of the fact that the alchemy all came together at the right time? Rabin, Arafat, the uh, the people's attitudes, the zeitgeist in through with the Palestinians as well as the Israelis. What would you, uh, first of all, would you uh, agree with me on the fact that it was the most successful administration and what was the alchemy that made it so? So first, thank you and thanks. To, it's great to see you again. It's been a while for obvious reasons, but uh, making a movie, I mean, he made it, but being in it was a great experience and it's a, uh, Sort of anyone can make the story of Camp David so fascinating to, to, to watch, but he did it. So I want to take issue a little bit with the premise of your question. Uh, I don't think the Clinton administration was the most successful. Now, was it less successful than others? I don't know, because none have been successful, frankly. You have to go back maybe to the the, the, the first Bush administration and, uh, and, and James Baker. It was different stakes. It wasn't trying to resolve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but at least the diplomacy really yielded results. I think I can be very self-critical of administrations in which I served and self-critical of myself. I think the Clinton administration was an administration of great goodwill, of great faith, 
of great passion, but not really of strong results. I mean, at the end of the day, as George just said, it's on during that administration that we had the failure of Camp David and the, you know, the, the seeds of everything that has happened afterwards. I mean, you know, we could talk about blame later, but there's no doubt that coming out of the narrative that came out of, of, of Camp David that is so vividly expressed in the, in, in the human factor, uh, that's still with us today. I mean, you know, Draw may now say, well, I could see that the, 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 the blame is to, is to be shared, but the narrative that came out of it, that the Palestinians cannot make a deal, they're incapable of making a deal, that what they want is to, you know, they, they, they want to go back to, to, to pre-48 um, and that they'll never accept the existence of the, of the Jewish state. That is still with us. And, I, you know, the next Israeli election, it's not only obviously you can't attribute it solely to Camp David or even maybe predominantly, but the next Israeli election is between the right and the more right. There is no peace camp competing in the, 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 the forthcoming elections. And they had, something was destroyed with this, you know, you go up to the, the top of the mountain and that may have in itself have been a mistake that we all made during the Clinton administration with this do or die summit. And if it dies, you don't have a safety net. The only conclusion is it's not possible for some and the Palestinians are to blame and therefore what's the point of trying? So, um, you know, it was followed then by the George W. Bush administration, the Obama administration, which I served, none of them, and then Trump, none of them succeeded. You could at least um, say that, you know, President Clinton gave it everything he had, uh, but at the end of the day, results matter and the results were not there. But in, in then again, Rob, in all due respect, had Rabin not been murdered, um, as Dror mentioned, we probably would have some type of uh, peace that would have emanated, uh, one would assume, which would have made the Clinton administration the most successful administration, no? So uh, this is a debate I've had with Dror and that I've had with several of the, the colleagues who've been uh, in the documentary, Aaron Miller in particular. Uh, you know, you could, the title of this, of this documentary could have been The Human Factor and the Non-Human Factor, because I really think it's both. And I do think it comes out, I know Dror focused on the human factor and they were, you know, you couldn't think of a more disjointed trio than Clinton, Arafat, and Barack. I mean, they had their complete opposites in every single way, uh, from the absolutely cerebral Barack who has, who completely lacks, he was brilliant, but he completely lacks in what Dror was describing was that empathy, the ability to put yourself in other people's shoes. There's no shoes he's ever worn but his own. I think that's, the, I think we know that. Um, mm -hmm. Clinton, who was all about deal making and, you know, is a politician, a fantastic politician, and Arafat, who was Arafat, sort of this mythological figure who didn't read agreements that he signed and read those that he didn't sign and didn't really, you know, when he said something, you had to spend hours trying to understand it. So the individuals really matter. I agree with Dror, and if Rabin had been there and Arafat had more trust in Rabin, and Rabin, I think, had more of a sense of, he killed many Palestinians, no doubt about it, but he also had a sense uh, and the political, I think, wherewithal, perhaps to do some things that Barack was not. But I come out of that movie again, and again, I'm colored by come what I came in into the movie. You know, it didn't work. I mean, there's been no peace deal, regardless of the combinations, whether it's Arafat or now President Abbas, whether it's Barack or Omar or Sharon or, or Netanyahu, whether it's Clinton or Bush or Obama. At some level, it is deeper. I, so I, I say this with all respect to, to Dror. It's deeper than the individuals. It's also a structural impasse at the core of Israeli-Palestinian conflict that cannot be resolved without the right people, but it's going to take more than the right people. Well, I would imagine we have to look. I think documentaries uh, have a reason to exist because they shed light on many issues. And and one, the way a successful documentary is, why a successful documentary is often successful is because it does have an emotional resonance for one's own life. And I can't Think, I cannot help but think that or hope that um, empathy or the human factor at the core of this is the answer to the solution of some kind of coexistence. I love some of the themes in the movie about um, the, the definition of future uh, or the two definitions of future. The, the, uh, there were, there were uh, the, um, uh, the notion of um, you can't have a solution unless you accept the other side. It would seem to me that the way out of this or forward 
is through the young people. Similar in the United States to, I mean, this notion of false fake news and, and truth. What is truth? Don't you think there's something to be said that we are not educating our youth, Israeli youth, Palestinian youth, in a correct enough way to show both sides from an early, early educational, you know, sort of acclamation to what the issues are and to be empathetic to the other side. I mean, could there really, until these next two generations sort of die, uh, hate to be so blunt, could we really have this kind of, because there's such bad blood um, for so many decades. I mean, where do we start? And is it with the young people? I'll throw that to, uh, to Rob. So, I mean, first, I, I really agree with the premise of what you're saying, and Joe was kind enough to mention the organization, the International Crisis Group, that I currently lead. And our motto is putting yourself in other people's shoes, understanding their perspective. And without that, I mean, that is obviously that's the, 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 the there's no answer without that. If you can't respect the other person's perspective, if you dismiss it, if you dehumanize the other person, then nothing else can work. I mean, it is so. It is a matter. It's a generational issue. It's an issue of 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 of, of the youth. Um, and Dror would be better placed to tell us what the Israeli youth today. What are they seeing? I mean, do they have interaction with Palestinians, and what can be done for them to see the Palestinians as more than simply you know non-human beings who today are not vaccinated against the COVID, even as Israelis, uh, fortunately for them, uh, get the vaccine, and then for Palestinians to see Israelis as more than the military person at a checkpoint or the person who's gonna come barge into their house. If that, if you can't change that, if you can't change the image of the other, then it's very difficult to justify making the difficult concessions that are gonna be absolutely required for any deal. So you're right. And unfortunately, I think, and I agree with, you know, things have, things were not great even during, uh, you know, during the good Oslo years in terms of Israeli-Palestinian perspectives of one another. It's gotten worse. I think social media is one of the reasons, of course, the situation on the ground in Israel, Palestine is such today that yes, the main interaction I would, but I, I defer to draw between Israelis and Palestinians is at a checkpoint or in a settlement or in a in a by definition conflictual uh, uh, setting. Draw, uh, I have a question for you um, regarding that. Uh, you know, I, I'm on the board of a Mid East peace organization uh, led by Ori Savir and uh, Shimon Peres's, uh, you know, uh, Yala. Um, and um, the premise is that young people using social media, because social media could be a great friend and has been, can align people in creating human connection. And that human connection is the way forward, is the way forward. What are your feelings about that? And, and, and number one, and number two, Dror, how do, this goes beyond, one would wonder, does this go beyond? simple anti-Semitism and anti-Arab sentiment. Um, in other words, the claim of the land, all of these issues that are so deep and inherent, how do we get beyond those issues to simply humanize people and say the statue of limitations is over on the Turks or the British or the Balfour Declaration or whatever? It's a I'm not being clear in the question, but really what it is, it, the question really is, um, with everything I've just said, uh, how do you feel about um, the future and letting go of the past? It's a great question. Look, I think for me, uh, after the first screening of the gatekeepers, which involved six heads of the Israeli Shin Bet, which deal, who deals with the Palestinians, my dad came to Yuval Diskin, who was the last head of the Shin Bet, and asked him, okay, I've watched the film now, so what is the solution? And Yuval Diskin said to him something very simple, which I didn't grasp at the time. He said, you know, not all problems have solutions. And sometimes we have to understand that we need to live with a problem and maybe not try to solve or resolve it because there are problems that are too hard to resolve. And maybe our goal should be to try to create a coexistence or normal life, and then through that, maybe we will be able to reach a solution in the future. 
If you ask me right now, I don't see, and I think that the, the movie, I agree with the ending statement of the human factor, which is there is no two-state solution now. I don't see any, any kind of hope for a two-state solution, at least in the next decade or two. Uh, um, so what is left is now is what you said, really to work on the education, to make life bearable, especially for the Palestinian people, uh, uh, so that we could build this generation that hopefully will manage to reach peace or to live to create coexistence that will enable us to 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 create the outcome of a two-state solution. I don't believe. Look, I don't believe that we have a kind of uh, a Yugoslavia uh, um, solution here, like one state. I don't believe that this can be. I didn't see it work anywhere else in the world when you have two parties that are so eager to define themselves and, and for independence. I cannot see a one, one state solution outcome. So for me now, the solution, as I said, would be to try to create coexistence first, built from the bottom up, from the beginning, a little bit of coexistence, more economical incentive to, the, to both sides, so people will learn to live with each other. Right now in Israel, we don't see Palestinians from the West Bank. I mean, as, as Rob said, I agree with him completely. But how, how do you have coexistence with a Jewish state? It's a tough question. I, I'm not, a, I don't have solutions. I'm that. asking I your opinion. I know you're not a, a sociologist. You made a movie that, uh, that sparked these things. I'm very interested to know your own sort of take on that. I look, I think you go to, to core of, of the Jewish state. Uh, uh, and that's why I'm saying that I don't believe in a two state that, that the, there will be a one state solution. I believe that the Jews need a state of their own, where they would be, will, will relax and know that every Jew, whenever someone is prosecuting him, can come to Israel and get the, the identity card and nobody will ask him any question. He can be immediately Israeli. I believe that this, this something should exist. Now, we occupy the Palestinian in the West Bank and, and there is another problem, which is Gaza Strip, which is dominated by Hamas. So the situation is complicated. What COVID expo exposed, by the way, what we see with COVID now, is that when there is a pandemic, those issues do not rise. You know, people are, are you know, this kind of heat, which was, you know, I need now to push for a, yes. you have to give me this, you have to give me that. Suddenly, the last year under COVID, everything was much more calmer. So in, in a sense, it goes again to the human factor, the basic, we are, as human beings, we want to live, we want our children to live and to have better life. And this is what interests us. The big yeah. topics of are, are less important. And, and, and I think that we have to go to basics now. Hey, uh, for, for getting back to the movie itself, I want to ask you, how did you get that insanely intimate, uh, those photos? Where did you get access to this, this, uh, this stuff? It's, I mean, it's, it's incredible. Uh, you're like, you feel like you're there. It can't just be White House photographers. <laughs> Tell well, us all. I, <laughs> Let me tell you a, a nice story. You know, uh, uh, when when I started when I started the movie, there was a story which told about Clinton coming to Israel after the assassination of Rabin, and 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 he, in the plane he asks uh, Dennis Ross, "Where is Paris right now?" And Dennis says to him, "He's shattered. You have to replace Rabin for him." And then Dennis told me that when the, he went down the stairs of the airplane. Uh, Paris came to him to shake his hand, and Clinton enveloped him in a, in a hug and hold him that way. So I, I had amazing stories from all of them. And I, I as you said, I'm a cin I was a cinematographer, so visually my movies, I, I care a lot incredible. about the it's incredible. It's actually incredible. I have to say, you knocked it out of the park with that element. And I want to say, when Clinton came down and embraced him, I'm going to get emotional now just thinking about it. I was um, kind of a, an emotional wreck. That was such a beautiful moment that was in the embodiment of what the movie was about. You evoked such 
I mean, it was a really, you felt this man love him. And when Clinton speaks to the press about losing and, and says, you know, goodbye friend, um, my God, it's, it was such a powerful, you really did an exceptional job, uh, in, you know, in, encompassing that. But, but so, so just let me come back because then I saw some pictures and I asked my archive researcher in America, where do those, where are those right, pictures? Right, right. Where do they, yeah. Where are they coming from? And she said the White House photographers. And I said, wait, I mean, is there more photos there? And she said, let me ask. And apparently there is freedom of information and act. And I asked for dates that I knew that something regarding the peace process was happening in the White House or somewhere else. And after nine months of going into the uh, administration, uh, I got 30,000 photos or 40,000 photos, which were my wet, allow me to say my wet dream as a, as a cinematographer, as a, as a photographer. <laughs> I have seen all the stories yes. in front of me in those photos. Rob, can, Rob was in, in, in Camp David. So when they told me the stories of what happened in Camp David, all of a sudden I had those photos, Clinton holding Arafat's hand, begging him to accept the offer of Barack. Hussein sees Bibi and telling him, you are not a leader, you have to grow up to become a leader. And all I had to do is just devise a nice and good uh, um, visual way to bring those photos into life and to create the sense that all I had to do, all I had to do. Yeah, no, that, but that's, that's it. It's so that's easy. What, that's why so many people do it so successfully. <laughs> that's what, what I like very much is that, you know, I managed to put the people, the audience, as the fly on the wall in those, correct. Rooms, in those rooms. And that's what's important. I and think that you're going to hear from people in questions afterwards that that is exactly the truth. Uh, Dora, may I just ask uh, Rob, uh, because I know my time is going to uh, end soon and questions are going to end and I'm going to be so frustrated. So a new administration's coming in, Biden's coming in. It seems like we had eight years of Bush, um, uh, George W. and eight years of Barack Obama, and not really very much movement from the from our perspective as uh, non insiders. Uh, Trump says we're going to make some big things happen with BB, and you know, yes, uh, there has been some nice movement where the recognition from the Emirates and Bahrain and I don't know Morocco, perhaps, right? Uh, so. What do you say to the incoming Secretary of State, whoever that may be? Um, what is the single thing you would say that they would need to focus on mostly to have some degree of success in terms of coexistence? I'm not even using two-state solution. Well, so first, the incoming Secretary of State happens to be Tony Blinken, who was a classmate of mine in high school growing up. So in high school, um, in high school in Paris, yes, uh, I've known him. Wow. For, yeah, I was. I think we were ten when we met. Um, I only say that because of the confirmation process. That's the only reason I'm going. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. So listen, I mean, uh, and I don't want people to to come out of this feeling uh, depressed, but I wouldn't expect, and you put it right. This is not going to be an administration that's going to try to do something big as Clinton tried, as even Obama tried. I mean, Secretary Kerry was as passionate about this as anyone I know, and he tried, he tried, he didn't succeed, but he tried. I think with Biden, you're going to see a slightly less emotional uh, uh, um, approach to the topic. And what I would say, first of all, do no harm. So, you know, undo some of the most harmful things that the Trump administration did, take his plan off the table, which is a plan that for a Palestinian is uh, is the man for capitulation. I mean, it's completely, you know, it's annexation. What about settlement, uh, Rob, what about settlements that just, why the hell would that, why would they incite that right now? I'm just asking. <laughs> I mean, um, Drew may be better place, but listen, at, at some level, uh, because they can do it, right? I mean, this has been going on, and again, it went on on Democratic and Republican watches, and nobody has found a way, just because, you know, how much energy are you going to expand? I think it comes, again, it comes across in the 
in, in, in the documentary, I remember very well when we were in the, with Clinton prior to Camp David, and we were discussing the issue of settlements. And the argument that Barack would make, which Clinton was sympathetic to, is, okay, make a big issue about settlements now. What is it going to change? Maybe you'll have one that will be that won't advance, the other one that will yes, advance. Sure, sure, sure. But when we get an agreement, we'll get rid of the settlements, and so don't don't create complications for me politically today. Of course, you never get the agreement, so you get the settlements and no agreement. That was the beauty of Barack, but the beauty of that argument, I think Biden Biden we know is opposed to to unilateral acts like settlements. Is will a U.S. administration make a huge deal out of it? Would it be able to stop continued creeping development? I don't think so. So when I say, at a minimum, and this is, Palestinians are going to be, you know, distraught at hearing this, but I think what we'll see is undoing, the, the, taking well the peace plan, resuming assistance to the Palestinians, reopening the consulate uh, to the Palestinians, which was shut down under Trump allowing the Palestinian mission here maybe to reopen because the Washington mission of the Palestinians has also been shut. So at least put the U.S. in a position where it could talk to both sides again. That's not a solution. It may not even be coexistence, but at least putting the U.S. back in the game. I think with Trump, the U.S. was so on one side that it was no longer, you know, the Palestinians couldn't even see them. It took themselves offside by being so aligned with the Israeli right, not with Israel, but with the Israeli right. And I think Biden has to make an effort to put the U.S. back in the mix. And then you never know. I mean, what's going to make a difference, I think, is some of what you were talking, which is the ch political changes in Israel and among the Palestinians. The Palestinians are overdue for a, some change in leadership. I mean, I'm not calling for anyone to go or anyone to come in, but, you know, it's a sclerotic leadership. They need, they need some new energy and new vision. And the Israelis, of course. I mean, I don't know if Netanyahu will be reelected, but there's going to have to be some change there. Rob, and then if this changes on that side, maybe you could get something going. Uh, question. So to me, the, the answer may not lie within the Palestinians per se, but in the rest of the Arab world. Uh, tell me about, uh, is there any hope with um, Lebanon? Is there any hope with, well, Syria is such a mess right now, but, but is there any hope with, um, let's say, Iraq or um, Turkey or, uh, you know, Tell me about uh, what your thoughts are on that. You, you've had a series of normalization agreements. You mentioned them, Morocco, UAE, Bahrain, Sudan. What do they mean? What does a normalization agreement really mean? So in an ideal world, it will mean genuine acceptance, but also I would have said some linkage to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict to get that to move. That's not what's happened. These were transactional barters in which the US paid with its currency to convince them to normalize with Israel. That's, you know, it's still a good thing. I'm sure Israelis now could travel more could travel to the UAE. That's, you know, and, and so in terms of people meeting each other, I'm not, I don't want to dismiss that. But these were not done because people awoke and decided we want to have good relations. It was Morocco, uh, it, the US recognized Moroccan sovereignty over the West Sahara. The uh, US agreed to sell advanced fighter jets, the F-35s to the UAE. They agreed to remove Sudan from the terrorism list. So these were giveaways, gifts that the US gave, rightly or wrongly, but disconnected from the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. What I would like to see with Biden is, yeah, let's continue moving towards this improvement of relations between Arabs and Israelis, but let's see if we could tie it in some way with some improvement in the lives of Palestinians. And they have been the, the uninvited guest of everything that's happened over the last several years. One could argue that there have been multiple times of, of chances and, and failed chances, but uh, that, then again, do they have a do they have a leadership, a, a cohesive leadership that can can get, uh, do what you're suggesting? Who's you know, uh, I mean, with Hamas on the one side and and um... again, I think the premise. I would say there is no cohesive leadership on the Palestinian side. It goes beyond the division between Hamas and, and Fatah. It's that within the Palestinian Authority, within the leadership. The, the leadership is completely divorced from its people. There have been, haven't been elections for more than a decade. Um, and, and, you, so you don't ha and you don't have a new vision. I mean, it really has been, unfortunately, for several years, paralysis at the very top. And that is going to have to change because, you know, I blame Israeli policy, U.S. policy. The Palestinians are the ones who are suffering the most from this. And they're going to have to do something if they want. And, and, and it's on them. It's not up to me to tell them what to do. But they're going to have to have a new vision, a new strategy to accomplish their goals because it has been 
unfortunately, an unmitigated failure. Yeah, Einstein's definition of insanity, correct? Um, right. And uh, draw, see what you've created. I have to say that what you've created, in my opinion, uh, is is art, and what you've done is uh, created a, a dialogue that people can participate in. And for that, I applaud you uh, very much. Uh, I would like to uh, turn the um, the 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 conversation over to uh, Jessica, who perhaps has some questions from the general uh, uh, audience, and uh, let her take it away. Great, thank you so much. I feel like a, the introverted girl sneaking up to the really boisterous crowd at a cocktail party. So this has been a great conversation. Uh, but yes, we do have a lot of questions coming in. Drawer, I'll direct this first one to you. Um, as an American Jew, I am grateful for the insight your film provided. Did you have a particular audience in mind when you put the film together? It's a simple answer, him. The American Jewish, or the American audience, was it was it was meant from the beginning and I have to say, because I lost hope of changing something in the Israeli public. So uh, I, the goal was to, to, to show the Americans um, what happened. I hope that the Israelis, the Israelis will be affected of it. The, the movie will come out after COVID will disappear. The movie had bad luck because of COVID the last year. We had to postpone the, the release of the movie, but uh, it will have an impact in Israel as well, I'm sure. But uh, as I said, I, I think that we are in a stage in Israel where peace is not a word that you speak openly out now. It's not something that people aspire here. They're interested in something else. But also, that was a great thing you said in the movie, or whoever said it in the movie. I'm not sure if it was if it was Rob or or, or Dennis. Uh, peace. We have to reframe the conversation. Peace is not really a word that should be used it's not the right word potentially thank you uh, rob i'll direct this next question to you during the fourth and fifth premiership of, of israeli prime minister benjamin netanyahu uh, has been involved in a number of corruption scandals dating back to 2016 and is currently charged with fraud breach of trust and accepting bribes how can the palestinians and the u.s trust him during peace negotiations <laughs> interesting, interesting question. I'm, I'm glad that you answered that. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, uh. Um, listen, I don't, you know, there's, there's, I, I don't want to sort of uh, mix people's behavior, corrupt or not, with whether they would uh, uh, keep to their word in a negotiation. And people could reach their opinion about Benjamin Netanyahu's track record as prime minister, and whether he did keep his word. Um, a mixed record again. Uh, only recently, he had an agreement about a, a uh, transfer of power with his partner, and he conveniently found a way out of it. Uh, but listen, at this point, I just don't believe. I mean, my simple answer is, I don't think there was going to to be. And one of either Kevin or, or Dror said it, and it said in the in the in the documentary, we're not on the verge of a negotiation that's going to yield a two-state solution. So that's not the question. We, we're dealing with many other questions right now. I could see why people might not trust Prime Minister Netanyahu, but that's that's not going to be the question to be asked because we're not going to have that kind of negotiation. At best, you're going to have a form of coexistence in which uh, Palestinian lives are improved and Israelis feel uh, safer and both sides feel safer. But um, for better or for worse, I don't think that the challenge is going to be trusting Netanyahu at the negotiating team. You know, I can't help. As Americans, sorry, go ahead. Rob, I can't help but look at the images that Drawer created in the documentary of wall-to-wall uh, -wall men, very few, if no women. And, you know, I go back to Gold of My Year, but I mean, don't you think that we need some women in, 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 in this situation on both sides that can solve this problem? I think that's, a very, I'm, not, I'm not being uh, funny by that, is this same kind of um, lack of human factor that often uh, men can bring to the table. I think that's that for me, that it goes without saying. Uh, you know, it is a very male documentary, not by any fault of drawers, but because it was a completely male-dominated. Uh, but is that part of the reasons for the not not having the the the, uh, the piece that we have today, in large order? I'm sure it didn't help. 
I'm sure it didn't help. And uh, I mean, even just look, I mean, it's unrelated, but it is related. Look at the performance on COVID, look at what uh, women leaders compare their track record to that of, of, of men. Um, but yeah, the, the diversity was not the trademark of either of the three peace teams. And it's, pity. and it's pity because I think women yield much more wisdom inherently uh, and emotionally from men. And, and it's about time that women will run the world. I mean, for 3,000 years or 5,000 years, the men have, have ran the world and it seems that we didn't really do a good job. So time to, to shift power. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Uh, Dror, I'll direct this next question to you. Uh, the questioner says, I don't understand why the consensus in Israel is that there can be no two-state solution. Coexistence is hard to imagine and is no solution even for the short term. Why are the Jewish electorate and politicians sh so opposed to a two-state solution? <laughs> I, I think it's, if you ask me, uh, and I cannot speak, you know, I, I don't like to speak on behalf of the Jewish electorate or on behalf of, I'm not representing, I'm, I can represent myself barely. Uh, <laughs> I think it comes from fear. There, the main two obstacles to the peace for me, one is the religious, the religion orthodox, who believe that God gave the, the, the land of Israel to the Jewish people and no one is allowed to give any inch of that land. This is one part which, because of that, Rabin was assassinated, by the way. He was assassinated by an extreme right-wing Jew who was taught by his rabbis that it's a, it's a traitor to, to give any part of the Israeli land. So that's one part which is very, very difficult to handle with. And they are those ultra orthodox, extreme right wing are inside the government, are inside the established defense stuff all over. So that's one thing. And the second thing for the Israeli people, it's fear. It's the fear of being annihilated. I think that the Holocaust, if I'm going to the primarily, primarily fear that every Israeli or Jew feels, it's from being annihilated. And, and the Palestinian in that sense, in their rhetorics, did not really help in, in easing that fear. So I think those both two, do two combination of, of factors yield to the situation where, where people, and you know, in a way, I think that the collapse of the peace talks in Camp David, which led to the second intifada and the thousands of dead, after those people have vowed not to use violence and thousands and thousands of people died during that time, created a trauma which is not easily... Thank you. And I agree, by the way, but just one second, I agree with Kevin, you know, when Moses went out of Egypt, uh, God told him, you have to wander around for 40 years until the generation of those who were slaves would, would die and then would come into the land of Israel with, with, the, new, with, with, with the new Israelites who were not, did not, were not enslaved. I think we need 40 years now in order for a new generation to come up and to maybe, maybe uh, create a coexistence. And Drew, Drew, I think that it's the same in, with diversity, particularly with African Americans in the United States of America. I think that uh, the the notion of true uh, racial equality it just can't happen with these generations, on, because young people don't have the same feelings. It's the same thing about young people in Yala; they don't care about these conflicts. They care about people. They're seeing each other. What did you do this morning? I had coffee with my mother. I'm in Yemen. What did you do? I had coffee. I'm in Sudan. What did you do? I'm in, in Jerusalem. That is something that has never been around before. So I think promoting that is the answer to getting rid of things that are so ingrained, as you say, Dror, in the, in the, in the psyche of the, or the DNA of the people on both sides, you know. 
Well, and we, we did have a questioner who asked uh, to both Dror and Rob, uh, who are the new younger people that we might not know who you think will be the next human factor faces of the Palestinian and Israeli sides? Good question. Yeah. So. Rob, so. Rob, I guess you're first. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I wish I could answer that because the fact is they're not known, and I, so I don't know. Do you have a son, Rob? I mean, do you have a son? I do have a son who went to Seeds of Peace, another organization that does. Uh, Maybe it's has, him. That, that tries to, but he's American, so uh -huh. unless I ask him to 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 take his really uh, citizenship. Listen, I mean, I was in. I was. It's been a while now, but pre pre COVID, I was in. Uh, I was in Israel and in, in, in the West Bank and. Uh, uh, what was clear to me is that, and, and, and saw a number of young Palestinians, that they had a whole bunch of new questions. Um, now, some of those questions uh, and answers may lead nowhere. I mean, some of them were thinking, well, why can't we live in a one state since this two state separation doesn't work? And there's a lot of reason why that may not be a, a better outcome either. But I, I sensed a feeling of, uh, uh, and again, I spent more time with them than I did with Israeli youth, but sort of Palestinians who were questioning obviously questioning the utility of violence, but also questioning the two-state solution, questioning whether there was a way to live just as one. Um, again, I'm not, and I don't know if you hear that in Yala, if that's one of the themes that comes across, but it is. it was interesting to me that I didn't meet a single Palestinian under the age of 40 probably, who said anything positive about a two-state solution, who said anything positive about the Palestinian Authority, who said anything positive about the US role. They had a very different frame of mind, which, will take time to, 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 to gel into something that actually can work. But I do think there's this potential there. I just don't, don't have names. And if I had names, I probably wouldn't want to expose them by, by mentioning them. George, do you have any names? <laughs> I, I, look, I think. Do you have a daughter? Yeah, I have a daughter and I have a son and they are uh, they are young and, and they are just at university now. And, and look, I'm not optimistic. I have to tell you, I'm not optimistic. I'm, I'm a, a young generation, old generation. I think that, I mean, there is election now in Israel in two months from now, in, in 24th of March, there is election, 24th or 23rd of March, there is election. The Palestinians issue is not mentioned once. I mean, the goal, the core of the of the election is Netanyahu, Bibi, yes or no? Is he corrupt? Can we replace him and all of that? And I mean, there is no incentive. And there was no incentive for Israelis to think about Palestinians for a long, long time. Israel can continue to live without really, you know, they are there. I mean, for me, it's easier to come to New York than to come to Ramallah, which is, let's say, half an hour drive from my home hometown. I cannot go there, or Gaza is definitely another plank for me. So I'm not really optimistic. I think the young generation, I don't see him politically engaged. He's, if he's engaged, he's engaged in something that is bothering him, whether it's the cost of living or how, what will my future be. They're not really interested in in changing the life of the Palestinians, and, and, and anyhow, <laughs> I, 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 I hope that we could end this conversation well, on a more optimistic. Well, the, the next, the, the, my question is: Is what's your, what's next for you, Drew? Well, I'm doing a move. I'm doing I'm doing a, a huge project which will be called Corridors of Power. Rob is also part of that project as well. Tell us, tell us about it, will you? It is about how American decision makers, uh, the top American decision makers, when they hear about genocide and crimes against humanity, what goes inside the room that prevents him from or makes him intervene in one place and not intervene in another place? Why Libya, they decided to intervene? And in Syria, although the carnage there will still suffer for what happened there, what was inside the room that prevented them from intervening? Why Bosnia took two years? And I have interviewed all the living secretaries of state, almost all the major, uh, and let's say, hopefully next administration, the secretary of state, national security advisor, head of uh, the head of the CIA, the new head of the CIA, William Burns. So yes, it's it's a riveting. It will be a riveting movie and and a series and and. 
very, very interesting also in terms of the human factor, in terms of the personality of the people inside the room. It sounds, it sounds marvelous. It sounds really cool, really cool. Rob, do you have any more optimism, more optimism than Drawer has? Um, I, I know I, I am an eternal optimist, so I actually have um, much more of a sense of um, a desire, even though it's not implicit uh, I think young people uh, will rally at some point and uh, and and try to do better. What do you think? Well, I, I'm, I'm a piss optimist, uh, which is I'm both a pessimist and an optimist. Listen, <laughs> I just don't like Talmudic reasoning. We're, we're like you know, we're like doing like. The... I think part of my, I mean, I have to be an optimist to be in my line of work since we try to prevent and resolve conflict. If I was a pessimist, I'd retire. So I do think there's always because of human willpower because of imagination, because of the desire to, to live a more normal life. I think between Israelis and Palestinians, I share fundamentally Dror's assessment. I do think, you know, we're hitting rock bottom, which means that there's only one way to go. And I, and, and, and I take, as I said, take solace from the fact that among Palestinians, there is a realization that they need to change, and think of a, a different way forward. I'm hoping that will take place from Israelis, but probably less quickly because one issue we haven't really raised is what incentives do the Israelis have to take the risk? And there's always there's always a risk with peace. There's always a risk with another state which will have some capacity to do you harm. There's always a risk of political price to pay. What has been the incentive for Israel? That's what's been missing. So the cost-benefit analysis has favored the status quo. If that changes, the Palestinian change, you know, I'm in that sense, I have to be an eternal optimist, but it's heavily, heavily leavened with uh, with realism and, and a degree of pessimism. So I will add to that, allow me, I will add to, the, to, that, to that note of optimism. I think that leaders matter. At the end of the day, leaders matter. And leaders can, if they, if you have a, a good leader who, who kind of draws a, a line or says, this is where we have to go. And he manages to create in his people, with his people, something that will move there, we can see a change. So. We are still waiting for those leaders to come. I would say the Nelson Mandela and the Willem de Klerk of the Palestinian and the Israelis, hopefully they will arise or they will rise one day and we will reach this, hopefully living uh, uh, in peace and, and security. I mean, the Jewish people deserve that. Really Thank after 2000, 2000 yeah. years, we deserve to live in peace and harmony with the environment. Not feeling prosecuted or being haunted uh, enough. But we need good leaders in order to reach that. The Palestinians, of course, deserve that too. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you uh, so much. I know we're right at the end of the hour. Just as a final question from our audience is, where can they see the film? Obviously, with everything uh, closed down right now, I know there might be a, there might be a tentative week-long theatrical run in Los Angeles. But for those who can't see it in theaters, uh, where can they see this? Well, Sony uh, Classics uh, intends to release it on cinemas, which I'm grateful to them because I believe in cinemas and I think that cinema is the best way to see a movie and not on your screen, on your flat screen, as big as it can be at home. And I think, look, I got the first injection of the COVID vaccine and I'm going to get the second one in a week from now. So I can tell you next time that we speak, how does it feel? Or maybe I will have, you know, a horde to cut out my horde and I will, I, I will be able. So I really hope that the vaccine will release the, the world from this pandemic, which ruined our life in the last year. And yeah. then hopefully at May, we will release the film theatrically all over the US. And may I also add that it, it, for member, my fellow members, uh, if you liked what you saw, please um, use your social media to tell people about it. Documentaries live and die on word of mouth. So by getting the word out and telling people, telling friends, uh, telling your loved ones that this is something to see will really help Sony Classics in their marketing efforts. And uh, with that, I, I wanna say um, uh, thank you, Toda uh, Raba to both Dror and uh, and uh, and Rob, thank you so much for this uh, wonderful uh, discussion, lively discussion, important discussion. And I want to also say um, 
to draw Lehitraot, and I would like to see you um, when I come to Israel in next. And uh, Rob, when I come to DC, I'll I'll uh, I'll give you a shout. Thank you very Thank much. You, Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Rob. I hope to see you soon. <laughs> I, I want to so. thank I want to thank all of you, Kevin, Dror, and Rob. This was such a fascinating and lively discussion. We're going to have to have you back with another film as soon as you do something new. Thank you so much for your time today. This thank was you. so much fun and so informational. So thank you so much to, to our viewers. I hope you enjoyed today's program and that you'll continue to help us make these events. Um, Possible. So please consider becoming a member or making a donation by, by visiting our website or by texting the word GIVE to the number on your screen. We can't do this without you. We have some terrific events coming up tomorrow. Politics in the time of coronavirus with politics professor Dan Schnur. And uh, to say that our U.S. news uh, feed is lively is an understatement. So tomorrow's um, we had 900 people on last week's call, so tomorrow is going to be a very interesting call. Um, Friday, a conversation with us, uh, U.S. Congresswoman Barbara Lee. And next week, uh, politics in the time of coronavirus moves to Tuesday. And then January 21st, we have a program on how technology transforms our ethics conversation with futurist Juan Enriquez and UCLA professor Terry Kramer in partnership with the UCLA Anderson School of Management. So please go to our website and register for these events. Everybody, please stay safe, stay informed. Kevin, thank you so much. Thanks, Happy Jim.